pleasure to introduce Monica Harry, who is visiting us from University of Glasgow. Many of you probably already know Monica. She has done a PhD here at St. Andrews in uh, 1980. Long time ago. <laughs> uh, well, she did her PhD with David Milner, who uh, at that time was launching his very influential theory about the dual stream of visual processing. So people who study visual perception know that um, visual stimuli are processed along two separate streams in the brain. And it's been discussed for a long time how one could best characterize these streams. And it is David Milner and Melvin Goodale's contribution to propose that one stream is vision for action, the other stream is vision for perception. We've had this theory for uh, <coughs> more than two decades now, and it's, it, it has now again come into debate because it has been found that some patients who are believed to have just one type of deficit, perception or action, actually also show si signs that they the other function could be impaired as well. So it's my pleasure to invite Monica and to hear the newest research in, in this topic and let's see what has happened with the dual stream of visual processing of David Milner. Monica. Okay, thank you very much, Daniela. And I think this is when you find out that really, you know, research doesn't actually progress. And I basically we were giving the same talk that I kind of gave 20 years ago. I hope not, <laughs> but, you know, we'll see. So it's actually really nice that um, Daniela has kind of given um, this kind of introduction about sort of talking about um, different pathways sort of for perception and action. And there are really different ways of kind of thinking about the brain. And one of the ways which is quite different you know, from the way that sort of I kind of think about it, because my thinking, as you can imagine, comes very much from David Milner, having been... I'm his PhD student. But people also think about uh, action and perception in terms of common coding. And Prince and really people around him have been very influential uh, in this kind of way of kind of looking at stuff. And the argument here is really that perceptual representations are stored together with the actions that they elicit. And so what this actually means is that the recognition of an object will automatically activate an associated action. So that's very much you know, the viewpoint sort of, of the common coding theory. So what this actually means that if we initiate an action sequence, we actually work backwards from the desired perceptual effect. And this then triggers the sequence of the actions that we need to execute to achieve the effect. So put very simply, seeing an object automatically activates, automatically activates the action. So you see an action is kind of the same. So from the perceptual system, we then act. And this is very much a sort of common coding theory background you know, to perception and action. Uh, in relation to that, and sort of really quite differently, there's obviously the dual root model of visual processing. And Wilhelm and Goodell's model is not the only model. And really confusingly, in the second part of my talk, I talk ab about another dual root model. But there are sort of different ways of thinking. So if you believe more sort of in the dual root models, what you would actually argue is that despite the phenomenology that we all have of a unified uh, visual experience, there are actually two different pathways in the brain, and they are functionally different and they are anatomically different. And what that actually means is that, is that vision for perception, on the one hand, is independent of vision for action. So we basically have different systems. So we have a vision for perception system, and we have a vision for action system. And I would actually argue that depending on which viewpoint you're actually coming from, and your interpretation, first of all, of neuroscientific data, and the interpretation of neuropsychological deficits is actually quite different. So it is actually important to kind of make these kind of distinctions. And I think if you think about um, sort of in particular neuropsychological disorders in terms of dual root models and in terms of differences between perception and actions, that actually can be quite informative. And one of the disorders I think this way of thinking is actually very informative for is hemispatial neglect. Um, I'm kind of assuming that most of you know what hemispatial neglect is. Um, if you don't, it's generally described as a failure to report, respond, or orient to stimuli uh, opposite the side of the brain lesion. <coughs> it's usually occurs after a lesion to the right half of the brain, to the right hemisphere. And if you then ask people to sort of perform certain visual tasks, they tend to ignore objects on the left-hand side. And this is kind of an example of a classic uh, neglect assessment uh, test called the behavioral inattention test, where you ask patients to cancel out sm all the small lines that they can see. And the patients are quite capable of understanding the task. They're just kind of ignoring the items on the left here. <sighs> And this is just an example of a patient sort of performing this. 
Yeah, sadly, the sound isn't actually working just now. So effectively, this is just me demonstrating to the patient um, what I want him to do. And as you can see, there's no problem with actually understanding the task, which is just to cross out all the small lines, all the lines, in fact, on this one. But what you notice is the patient's head is very much kind of deviated to, to the right-hand side. So all the kind of attention is focused on the right. He actually starts, you know, penciling out the lines from the right-hand side of the page, you know, rather than from the left, which is more commonly what you and I would do. And then another thing I think what you also notice here is that lines are crossed out repeatedly. So that rather than moving over to the lines on the left, the patient actually repeatedly sort of cancels out the lines um, on the right. And that you can actually sort of see this online. So this is actually a sort of stroke training and awareness uh, module, which was kind of uh, really designed um, for people who kind of work with stroke and who want to find out more about visual disorder. So people who kind of are sort of stroke nurses kind of on the wards who want to gain a little bit more insight in terms of the kind of symptomatology that you get after occipital and parietal um, strokes. So there's modules there kind of describing hemispatial neglect and also describing hemianobia. And it's a freely available online uh, non model, which may be quite nice for teaching. So if you go to this website, you can actually download those um, movies. And really just to put neglect, you know, generally sort of into the sort of framework um, sort of of the NHS, it's actually quite frequent after right hemisphere lesions. It affects up to 80% of people with right hemisphere lesions initially um, straight after the stroke. It's the strongest a single predictor of pure functional recovery after right hemisphere stroke. So people who suffer from neglect do spend much longer time in the hospital. They're much more likely to end up in a nursing home compared to being released you know, back uh, to their homes. And therefore, the cost really to the NHS is really quite great. And there's actually a great need to kind of obviously try and rehabilitate um, the actual uh, syndrome. Really in line with this, and quite depressingly, people have actually tried to come up with effective treatments for hemispatial neglect. And so far, if you look at sort of clinical trials and the sort of science guidelines and the Bowen um, Cochrane reviews, actually look at studies which are in, uh, around in the literature and evaluate them you know, for effectiveness. At present, no recognized treatment actually exists that can be re recommended to be applied in a clinical setting. So there doesn't really seem to be any effective way at the moment act actually rehabilitating neglect. And I come back to this a little bit later. What's also quite relevant, I think, for the actual disorder is to look at the classical um, lesion location. And the lesion location that's most typically kind of demonstrates, um, causes hemispatial neglect is lesions in the inf inferior parietal lobe, Boltzmann's area 39 and 14, and also lesions in the superior temporal sulcus. And um, Otto Karnet was actually quite instrumental in actually sort of also implicating more temporal areas, you know, as being a sort of common denominator of sort of causing hemispatial uh, neglect. Just briefly say a little bit about the assessment of neglect. You've seen one example already before where the patients are asked to cancel out um, all the small stars and you kind of see this bias. Again, this is the example I showed you in the video where the pa patients are asked to cross out all the lines. You see this sort of repeated crossing out of lines on the right, uh, not of lines kind of on the left. Similar idea here, you, the patients are required to cross out all these and R's. They tend not to forget, you know, with the letters that they have to cross out. So memory impairments are not particularly dominant in hemispatial neglect, although there are other people to kind of make more of a case about memory disorders also being uh, a prominent feature. If you ask people to sort of make um, sort of marks, uh, mark lines in the center, you get this typical rightward um, deviation. I'll say a little bit more about sort of bisection and landmark behavior in the second part um, of my talk. This is sort of copying behavior, copying from memory. The important thing, I think this is a refer to, these are all subtests of the behavioral inattention test, which is effectively a standardized uh, clinical tool. And what's quite nice about this is for you get a cutoff score sort of indicating whether neglect is present for each of these individual subtests, but also um, for all subtests uh, put together. So you kind of have some idea of sort of is the neglect present or not and just what's the severity of the disorder. I think one of the problems with this test is there's great emphasis on perception. So you're purely, purely looking at you know, what are the perceptual problems um, that these patients have. And I think this is kind of interesting when we then come back again sort of to these kind of dual root, mod root models of perception uh, and action. And if, if we kind of look at the dual root models, what people will actually, what Milner and Goodell actually said, and they kind of really started thinking about neglect in this way, really when I kind of started my um, PhD um, here, they were actually saying, you know, we, we, do, we know already that our perception of the world is very much kind of mediated, you know, by the visual um, ventral stream. And our action of the world is very much mediated by the visual dorsal stream. And this is kind of what the dual do word model is all about. And other people you know, who are kind of based more on the common coding uh, frame kind of very much disagree with it. But this is kind of their argument. 
And they're actually saying, if we look at these models in relation to neglect, what we already know is if you look at the critical lesion side, we already know that the critical lesion side is either in the inferior parietal lobe or in the superior temporal lobe, these kind of areas here. So the dorsal stream as such is actually spared um, in hemispatial neglect. So what we might be able to infer from that is that all these perceptual difficulties which I've just described to you, which are quite dramatic in these patients, might not necessarily be uh, reflected in their actions. So they might actually be able to act on objects and interact with objects because that's what the visual dorsal stream is re uh, responsible for. Whereas on the other hand, they can clearly fail to um, perceive objects, they have perceptual problems, but there could be a dissociation. And maybe this is kind of uh, important and can be exploited. So just to kind of uh, investigate this a little bit more, one of the confusions which I think often arise in relation to this sort of perception and action model is what people actually understand as actions which the dorsal, visual dorsal stream is implicated in. And Mina and Gurdjieff are actually quite specific about this because they're basically saying the dorsal stream is actually Im implicated when stimuli are presented uh, in the here and now. On the other hand, as soon as time is allowed to pass or an explicit perceptual mapping has to be made, then the ventral stream is required for successful performance. So therefore, if we're now looking at the syndrome of hemispatial neglect, if we do find any kind of action impairments, they should mainly affect offline action control. So when the patients are allowed to directly interact with objects, they should actually be okay. So really from this model, you can make very specific predictions. So we would actually expect neglect patients to show some spared immediate pointing. So when they can directly interact with the objects, they should be okay, even in left space, or even in the space where they show these old dramatic perceptual problems. On the other hand, if we look at sort of uh, tasks which, action tasks which aren't directly interacting with the objects, for example, if you're looking at delayed pointing or anti-pointing, that's where problems should occur. And we've done a whole series of experiments really sort of looking at these specific um, predictions, and I just uh, show you one uh, set of experiments which really makes this point. So we actually ran an experiment where we compared in neglect patients uh, poor pointing, where uh, patients were simply asked to reach for targets which were presented in different um, spatial locations, and they just had to reach directly to the target. And we compared that uh, to an anti-pointing task where the patients were asked to reach for a target which was actually presented here, but then basically perform a mirror image reach to the exact location on the other side. So for left targets, they had to reach to the equivalent position on the right, for right targets to the equivalent um, position on the left. Uh, we then looked at the, we did some sort of typical uh, lesion analysis, so we mapped all the lesions onto a sort of T1 uh, weighted uh, image using MRI across software, which is kind of a standard way nowadays of sort of mapping lesions. And we then also performed uh, lesion symptom mapping, where we were trying to actually associate more specifically the lesion location uh, with the specific um, behavioral um, symptoms which we expected the patients to show in some of the tasks. But first of all, um, just to show you a picture of the kind of patients that we used. So first of all, we had a control group which were right hemisphere lesion patients without neglect. This is the kind of the lesions overlay of those uh, patients in the different um, slices. They never, and this is kind of important, they never really showed neglect at any time. So we tested them sort of quite soon after the stroke. Neglect was never present. This was the group um, of right hemisphere lesion patients who showed neglect. T traditionally, uh, patients with neglect tend to have larger lesions as well. And I can just say that now that the size of the lesion really did ha didn't have any implications in the behavioral impairments that they showed, but these patients did show larger lesions very much in line with other studies. The patients all were impaired. They were at least impaired on one of the neglect um, tests. Most of the patients were actually impaired um, on all of the neglect tests. The BIT is the one I showed you before line by section, you just look at bias and the balloons, a similar visual search task. And again, just to kind of show you that we're kind of looking at a pretty much uh, sort of classic group of neglect patients. So if overall we just sort of subtracted uh, le the lesions of the patients with neglect from the patients who just had right hemisphere lesions without neglect, the critical lesion side were again the inferior parietal lobe and the superior temporal um, gyrus. Very much, you know, those are the lesions which are generally implicated in neglect. That doesn't show you, tell you much about task um, behavior. So now to go back um, to the actual task. First of all, what do the patients show? What kind of behavior do the patients show in the poor pointing task? So when they can point directly um, to targets on the left and the right. And we compared, first of all, this is the neglect group here. This is the, we had right hemisphere lesion control group. We also had healthy controls. These were people who were perfectly healthy, sort of matched in age. And hopefully, as you can all see, in the poor pointing condition, 
the neglect patients were absolutely perfect, just like everyone else. So there was absolutely no difference between how, they were could, how well they could reach the targets compared to the various control groups. Even on the left, there was no difference between left and right. And remember, the left space is really the space where they show all these perceptual problems. But if they're reaching for an object, they're actually very good at that. In the anti-pointing task, really dramatically different result. First of all, if you look again at the two control groups, people are slightly worse. It's a harder task. You, know, you have to kind of identify the location and then kind of remap, remap it onto the, uh, an, the equivalent position. But the neglect patients actually found this very, very much harder than both of the control groups. So they were in all four, in all the uh, spatial locations, they were dramatically and significantly uh, impaired. And we also found a positive correlation uh, with neglect severity. So the stronger the neglect, the greater the errors that they performed. So the more they kind of deviated you know, from the position that they really should be uh, pointing <coughs> to. And if we, we then sort of performed the sort of voxel-based lesion mapping. So we're then saying, you know, for this fairly dramatic uh, anti-pointing accuracy impairment, what are the voxels which are kind of critically implicated and sort of driving this impairment? And what we found here is that apart from the inferior parietal lobe and the superior temporal gyrus, we also found the middle temporal gyrus kind of implicated in mediating, being responsible for that kind of behavior. So these were the lesions which are classically associated you know, with the anti-pointing um, inaccuracy. And also the parahippocampal uh, gyrus. So what can you conclude sort of from um, this sort of behavioral uh, experiment? So first of all, it seems to be that neglect patients are kind of unimpaired in pro-pointing. And this is actually in line with a uh, range of recent other studies who've kind of really demonstrated sort of similar behaviors when neglect patients are allowed to interact um, directly with objects. So it seems that online action control is relatively unef unaffected. So we can hopefully argue from this that we already know um, that the visual dorsal stream is unimpaired in terms of anatomy. It now seems to be that we can argue it's also unimpaired in terms of function. So functionally, it really seems to be okay. What we did find is that the neglect patients presented greater errors in the endpoint accuracy um, of their anti-movements. And they seem to be therefore suffering from a deficit in detecting and transforming an explicit spatial mapping, uh, spatial representation for remapping. Because of course what you have to do in the anti-pointing task, you have to identify the location of the target and then remap it onto the opposite side and then reach towards that side. And this, this is clearly uh, where the deficit um, actually occurred. And I think what we can really say from this is you know, that really um, immediate action do actually differ you know, from other actions like fake action, delayed actions, or sort of anti-pointing actions. And I can't, we have done other experiments where we found similar impairment in neglect patients, for example, in delayed um, actions. So depending on the kind of action that you're actually investigating, you know, different areas are kind of implicated um, in those uh, action control uh, movements. And regarding these kind of problems, you know, the patients really had, you know, with the anti-pointing, there is actually a sort of an fMRI study that was performed by Kolizak in 2007, who implicated a similar area uh, in their sort of fMRI studies. And what they actually did um, in the fMRI study is they compared um, grasping and reaching, so grasping to an object and reaching for an object, with pantomiming a reaching and a grasping object. And when they then subtracted those two conditions from each other, they actually found that for the pantomime reaching and grasping, the right middle temporal gyrus really also had to be active to kind of you know, generate uh, the sort of pantomime reaching and grasping movements. And that's very much in line with our data because this was one of the areas which was also critically implicated in our anti-pointing um, <coughs> task to kind of be impaired and kind of generating you know, the anti-pointing um, errors. So for those kind of tasks, we do, seem to, the, we do seem to have to rely on areas kind of outside the visual dorsal stream to kind of really mediate um, our actions. And this is kind of nice supporting evidence for our sort of um, study. So really from this, what are the implications really, first of all, um, for perception um, and neuroscience? Well, hopefully I've kind of shown you that action and perception control can actually disassociate. So I um, don't really buy into this kind of common coding uh, model, which I presented to you on the first slide. But it's also important to know that really not all actions depend solely on the dorsal visual stream. So once we become to things like pantomimed actions, fake actions, more complex anti-pointing actions, delayed actions, maybe these kind of actions actually require additional and distinct neural networks. And from our data, it kind of seems to be that they require more sort of temporal and occipital um, areas. And I think this is actually what I would like to argue from this, is that contrary really to a range of neuroscientific um, studies, it is actually important to realize that maybe when we're dealing with offline actions, they are not really mediated by the same areas in the brain as real actions. 
So when we're kind of talking about, for example, um, faking uh, movements in the scanner, and a lot of studies do this because it's much easier when people are sort of tied up in an fMRI scanner to just pretend to do a movement rather than really do a movement. We can't really assume that the data and the, the results you get from that can actually be generated you know, to real movements because I think we are actually looking at different areas. For example, when I move around here and also when I then play on a Wii, I think those are fundamentally different things. And I can totally believe that because I can't do anything on a Wii. So I think it's just much more complex and you need other brain structures than you need to do in sort of picking up an apple, for example. So I think these are the kind of the implications um, for perception uh, and neuroscience. The other implications, I think, are for rehabilitation of neglect. And I'd just like to spend a little bit of time really sort of making this kind of argument. So the argument here is like if what we found is correct and that neglect patients are actually quite good in interacting with objects, even on the neglecting side, then why don't you uh, sort of develop a rehabilitation approach where you get them to interact loads with objects, really activate the dorsal stream, and then see if there's some filtering through you know, to the perceptual impairments that they have. Because a bit like Daniela mentioned in the beginning, we all know that you know, even if you believe in this idea of dorsal and ventral streams and separate visual streams, there are lots of interactions, so the streams clearly interact, and maybe we can actually use that to then improve um, neglect symptoms. And this idea is actually not new, so kind of using actions to kind of really improve um, hemispatial neglect, um, studies really have been done uh, sort of more than 10 years ago, sort of by myself in particular, sort of Ian Robertson, where we ask patients to reach out and interact with objects kind of repeatedly, sort of over a sort of two-week period, and we then looked at whether we would actually find an improvement in their BRT score, so really in their uh, neglect symptoms. And really a bit, little bit more um, precisely what we had is we had an intervention group where we asked neglect patients to grasp for a rod in the center. If they didn't actually quite do this correctly and the rod would actually tilt, they would get proprioceptive feedback from that and then be encouraged to kind of regrasp until the rod was actually centrally uh, grasped and kind of held straight. And we compared that to an intervention condition where the, people, where the patients were simply asked to pick up the rod on the right-hand side and put it down. So they did some sort of very basic motor action, but they didn't really use visual motor feedback to kind of guide you know, the perception um, of the rod. And we had some sort of okay results kind of in this study. So we asked patients to, so we showed them how to do the extra task over three sessions. We then got them to do it for 10 sessions in their home. And we then kind of looked at, you know, how was there an improvement kind of on BIT score? And we, we found an improvement one month after the intervention, uh, after f at the follow-up, one month follow-up in the intervention group. The intervention group slightly improved. And I wasn't really terribly excited about the result at the time, but Ian Robertson basically was, because the patients that we tested were chronic patients, so these were patients who had neglected like for a year. And we still found some improvement in the intervention group. But we've since sort of just about finished uh, sort of another study now where we try to actually make the intervention a little bit more feasible uh, to be applied um, in the clinical um, setting. So what we've actually done now, and we just kind of finished really the analysis of this data now, is we actually reduced uh, the training from three to two days and reduced the number of sessions that the patients then trained uh, by themselves from two to one session. And the session was much shorter, only 15 minutes. We were then slightly more ambitious in kind of our assessment of the outcome uh, measures so we actually looked whether there was kind of an effect not just at one month uh, sort of post-intervention, but four months post-intervention. And rather than just looking at an improvement on neglect scores, we also said, well, do these uh, patients actually improve overall? Do they have an increased uh, quality of life? Are they more likely to socially particip participate, to kind of move outside, to go shopping? Are there any changes in mood, uh, in emotional, in commun communication, etc.? And to assess that, we actually used the stroke impact scale, which is a, a scale reasonably commonly used um, in, a new, in a clinical setting to kind of really assess people's uh, stroke outcome. So this was actually designed. So we had two sessions where we um, sort of instructed the patients on what to do. We had a quick assessment after that. We then had them run 10 sessions once a day in their home <laughs> over a period of sort of um, two weeks. We then did a quick assessment, then we left them completely alone and followed them up, up again at um, four months. Um, these are kind of the char characteristics of the patients. 10 patients in the inventor intervention group, 10 patients in the control group. Um, quite well matched for age, times and strokes. So these patients weren't quite as chronic. So they were kind of obviously not acute. Uh, by medical terms, they would still be judged as chronic, but you know, they were literally on average three months post stroke and not really quite as long term as the previous study. And they were quite matched, um, so well matched sort of for neglect score, initial um, BRT score. So first of all, um, and again, you remember in the intervention group, they were actually encouraged to grasp what's in the center, sort of repeatedly over sort of 15 minutes. They were placed in different spatial conditions. 
In the control group, they were simply asked to reach with their right hand to the right hand side of the rod. And I think this is important. All these patients effectively had right hemisphere lesions. So they had some sort of motor impairments with their left hand. So we only asked them to use the unimpaired hand. So they're only ever using their right hand. So we're either using their right hand to grasp the center of the rod or to just grasp the side and kind of pick it up and uh, put it down again. But they were using the hand that they could use because there are also intervention studies where you ask the patients to use the hand which is actually impaired. And there's big problems actually with uh, consent and uh, sort of retention of patients in this. First of all, we tested them on line by section. How well do they actually perceive um, lines? As you can see, sort of initially, you know, well matched sort of for bias. If anything, the intervention groups sh showed a larger error really than the control group. Already after two sessions, there's a big improvement in the uh, sorry, I should really put this away. In the intervention group, there's some improvement in the control group, but the improvement that we see in the intervention group then also remains the same after uh, two sessions, after 12 sessions altogether, and then it follow up. And this graph just gives you the sort of percentage improvement. So as you can see here, the control group improves a little bit as well, but there's a much bigger improvement kind of in the intervention group, and that actually stays the same also after four months. So it seems to be a bit of a long-term effect. And you can think, okay, line section is actually quite similar to bisecting a rod or grasping a rod at the center. So what actually happens to the neglect score? And with the neglect score, again, it was quite similar. So quite well matched baseline. After two sessions already, you see a big improvement which gets slightly bit higher, not, none of this is significantly different after the 12 day session, but then it actually stays high at the four months follow up. And I think that's really the important thing because you really want to show that whatever you're improving is actually long term. And again, in this graph, you can kind of see the percentage improvement. So again, little improvement in the control group, none of this statistically significant, big improvement really in the intervention group already after two days, which then sort of remains um, the same. And then really the big one is really um, what kind of happened um, on the stroke um, imp impact scale where we're kind of measuring sort of different dimensions um, sort of of these patients kind of engaging you know, in their everyday life. And what we actually found, and this is always really the, the big test you know, for any kind of intervention study because to find a generalization to other activities is extremely difficult and extremely rare and not really many studies um, find it. So what we actually found here is that again, and we, this is a big test to kind of apply, it's a big questionnaire, so we only did this at baseline and then again the four months follow up. So what we found is that the patients in the intervention group showed some sort of increase in the activities kind of of their daily lives, whereas the control group stayed the same. And I haven't really had time because really, as you can see, these two groups aren't terribly well matched for, ba for baseline, but they are now, so they're now perfectly matched at the end of the trial, and this, this uh, finding still holds. And if you look at sort of clinical trials and speci specifically clinical trials in relation to uh, neglect, a lot of them actually claim big effects. A lot of them sort of, some of them claim generalization to other tasks, but most of the trials are really not controlled trials. So it's, it's surprising the, the very, very little number of controlled trials that you see, which kind of show a sustained effect over time and be then also some generalization kind of to other tasks. And I think that's one of the reasons why at the moment you no know neglect therapy is actually recommended because ideally you want to show effects in a controlled trial and you want to show long-term effects that kind of translate onto other behaviors. So I think this is um, quite encouraging. So hopefully what we can conclude um, from um, this visual feedback training is that theory-driven intervention can actually lead to successful rehabilitation, that there is some sort of transfer to activities of daily living, that this intervention hopefully, as you can see, it's a fairly basic intervention, it's cost-effective, it's easy to apply, and it's easy to train staff and carers to actually do it. And one of the things which is, I think is also really crucial is the patient doesn't actually require an insight into the disorder in order to actually perform the actual rehabilitation procedure. Because at the moment, what um, health professionals tell uh, neglect patients to do as some kind of intervention, because nothing is actually formally recognized, is scanning training. So patients are encouraged to scan the left-hand side and so encouraged to scan the left side of space. And of course, they don't really know that they have a problem. So and as the minute you tell them to stop doing it, they stop doing it. Whereas with this task, you don't really need this kind of insight into the disorder. But of course, what we need to do now is there's obviously a need for a larger clinical trial to assess the uh, efficacy of this particular treatment. And obviously, I have a sort of major clinical collaborator who I've collected all this data with. And he basically says, you've shown this in 10 patients, don't talk about it at all. It means nothing. We need a bigger trial. But of course, I am talking about it because there's no way that I'm doing a larger clinical trial. So that's not my job. So this is as good as it gets, you know, from my point of view. OK, so for really, it's the first part of my talk, which is really the uh, longer part. What are the overall conclusions? Well, hopefully, I've shown to you that neglect patients are not impaired in online action control. 
but they, that they fail in indirect offline actions, that therefore we can really um, uh, exploit these sort of unimpaired online reaching abilities for successful rehabilitation. And this actually impairs that there clearly there must be shared influences of vision for action and vision uh, for perception. And I think this is actually quite nice because I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of evidence kind of in the literature that perception can influence action. There's much less evidence saying action can actually influence perception. And hopefully uh, this is what I've kind of shown with these experiments here. And therefore, again, I've already said this before, that maybe you know, when we're looking at actions and when we're kind of talking about actions, we need to be more precise about how we actually define actions and not all actions are the same and not all actions are mediated you know, by similar structures. Okay, so this is really the, the sort of first part of my talk, which is kind of more um, the clinical side. And what we've done now is we kind of, what I already said before is um, I don't really want to move on to sort of a large scale um, clinical trial. But one of the things I am actually interested in, and this is kind of very much driven by the motor literature, is to actually compare this visual feedback training which we've been doing with TDCS, which is transcranial direct current um, stimulation. Because there's been a study sort of by Geron Finkslab, la, in Geron Finkslab, one by Roland Sparing, who actually applied um, TDCS to the left parietal cortex, so they actually performed some sort of inhibitory function to the left parietal cortex in neglect patients. And by doing that, they actually found that the neglect symptoms actually improved. Because the idea is that if you have a right hemisphere lesion which kind of needs to neglect, you get a sort of overactive uh, left hemisphere. So the left hemisphere is kind of too active. If you dampen down that activity, you actually find an improvement um, in uh, neglect function. And really what, we, what we're now sort of trying to do is we're now trying to combine um, this uh, TDCS, uh, applying TDCS you know, to the undamaged uh, left hemisphere in combination with this sort of behavioral training which we've been doing. And we're hoping that if we combine TDCS with VFT training, that we actually get the biggest um, sort of behavioral sort of rehabilitation effect, that we find the biggest improvement uh, in neglect um, symptoms. And the reason we're kind of hoping that this is true is very much sort of taken from the motor literature, because TDCS has been quite successfully used in kind of trying to improve motor function. And it's successfully, it's particularly successful uh, when the patient's actually performing motor actions kind of at the same time. So you find the biggest improvement in kind of you know, improving paralysis by applying sort of TDCS together with some sort of behavioral training. And this is really something that we're investigating um, just now. And I just talked to Daniela about getting the ethics and how painful it is. And I think we're kind of pretty much at similar stages doing this. So I don't know why we're doing it, actually. It's just too bad. OK, so th th this, was, this is now kind of really moving on to stuff which is kind of not clinical, because you know, the clinical stuff you know, takes a very, very long time um, to actually do. So at the same time, um, I've always kind of had an interest really in kind of what um, happens in spatial biases um, in healthy subjects. And this is really stuff um, which I spent a long time sort of doing in Bristol and I kind of moved away from and I've now sort of started to investigate a little bit more. Uh, I think most of you will actually know that you know, all of us, and it's not just um, people, also animals, we all of us show a sort of subtle bias in favoring left uh, space when it comes to visual attention. So we all have a bias sort of orienting um, towards um, left space. So for example, in tasks like this, we are asked to kind of judge you know, where the center of a line is. We all show a subtle kind of bias to, to the left hand side, sort of like this. So all this mark here is objectively actually further to the left we tend to kind of judge that as sort of being centrally presented. And the idea is that because the right hemisphere sort of favors um, sort of attention, we tend to get an exaggeration of kind of left space, you know, in um, healthy subjects. And people really have known about this really for sort of quite a long time. So we all sort of favor left space. People do it, animals do it. There seems to be this orienting bias towards the left space. And there are certain uh, properties which kind of influence this bias. So it can get modulated, you know, by certain tasks and certain situations. And one of the uh, things which can actually mediate the bias is actually fatigue. So there's sort of similar studies sort of by uh, Tom Manley who basically showed that the left foot bias that we all show gets attenuated and shifts towards the right foot bias with decreasing um, alertness and fatigue. So the more fatigued we become, the less of a left bias we actually show. And, he, and they've kind of very much argued, you know, that this is kind of in line, again, with another dual root model, which talks about dorsal and ventral streams, but they're kind of slightly different kind of in position to the Milner and Goodell dorsal and ventral streams. So in Corbetta and Schumann's attentional model, they say that healthy people like you and me have a right hemisphere naturalized ventral attention network which underpins alertness. 
And the venture attention network doesn't really quite run here. I mean, it kind of runs sort of much more superiorly here, but it doesn't really matter. So we have a ventral kind of attention networks which kind of underpins alertness. And that's the same in all of us. And obviously, if you perform a task over a long period of time, you then get um, fatigue. So you have a decreased activation in this network, which then gives the left dorsal orienting network, which is pretty much kind of this network, a competitive um, advantage and therefore driving behavior rightward. So this is kind of very much the idea. We all have a sort of light, right lateralized alertness network, which sort of tires out um, over time. And the question that we were then really asking in the remainder of my talk, which I will sort of try to address is, is this really true? Do all of us really have a right hemisphere lateralized attention network? Is this kind of a uniform feature kind of in the healthy population? Or maybe are there differences you know, between um, different people on this? And uh, this was actually, and I have to say, I mean, th this, uh, this idea pretty much came almost entirely sort of from my um, sort of PhD student. Because when we were kind of doing this kind of work, he went through the literature and he basically said, Monica, you do realize that in all studies kind of, of spatial attention, people have a leftward bias, but there's always a subsection of people, you know, ranging between 5 to 30 percent to show a rightward bias. And I'm like, yeah, you get some variation. I mean, you look at stupid bias, you know, some people are left, some people are right. It's totally boring. And he's like, mm, I don't know, really know. Because maybe, what, what do you do? Maybe this is meaningful. Maybe there are general differences between people. Maybe some people show a left bias and some people show a right bias. And already McCord in 2001 actually kind of noticed it and said, well, this might be meaningful. There might be genuine um, observer differences, but nobody ever really kind of followed this up until a paper was published by Tabor de Schotten in 2011. And this is when I sort of paid a little bit more sort of attention to this idea. And what they actually showed um, in their paper was that the relative lateralization of the white matter pathway predicted the degree of spatial bias. So what they were actually showing in particular, and it doesn't really matter what we're talking about here in terms of connections, but you basically have a very big sort of white matter pathway which kind of connects parietal and frontal areas. And what they actually showed in the paper is that in participants where this pathway was larger in the right compared to the left, that these participants deviated more to the left in line bisection tasks whereas participants who had the opposite asymmetry actually showed either a right bias or no bias. So there seems to be some relationship between the size of your white right matter tract and the kind of bias you, that you show on these kind of tasks. And this is really what I thought was actually quite interesting because there really seems to be maybe there are anatomical differences between people which kind of drive the fact that somebody has a left bias or somebody um, has a rightward bias. So what we then really kind of started asking more specifically this question, saying, well, is it possible that some people actually have a right with bias and that this can actually be a trait, you know, rather than just a random variation uh, in the data like you would expect? And if they do, if, the we, if we can identify people who show a right bias, do this then show the different behavioral uh, patterns? For example, if you look at time on task, if you look at performance over time, do they shift in the same direction as uh, people who show a left foot bias? So we kind of really decided, and this is actually Chris, so Chris kind of decided to sort of investigate this um, a little bit more. So we used this kind of task, which I kind of shown you to you before, the landmark task, where rather than asking people to bisect lines, you present them which line which are already pre-bisected, and you taste, say to them, which of these two ends do you think is actually shorter you know, or longer? So we did this um, sort of in two sets of experiments. So we first had um, 20 participants who we tested in three different sessions, because what we really wanted to know is, is people's bias, if they do show a bias, is this bias consistent over time? So do they show the same bias repeatedly on different occasions? And if this is true, if we kind of establish that maybe different people kind of do this, we then wanted to see what happens to the time on task effect. So what happens when you then ask people to do a task prolonged over, peri over a period of time? Because if you follow the um, Corbetta and Schumer model, what you would actually say is, People have a right hemisphere lateralized attention network that sort of tires out over time, so everybody should shift right, right. So whether you have an initial left bias or right bias, right bias people's behavior kind of should um, shift rightwards. So those are the kind of two questions that we kind of really addressed um, in two experiments. So this is really the paradigm, very simple. We had an initial fixation cross. The lines was presented for 150 milliseconds, so quite briefly, quite a difficult task. The participants then had to decide whether the this line was actually longer or this line was longer. From that, again, we then calculated the point of um, subjective equality. You know, and usually if you do this over a large number of subjects, you find sort of overall left foot bias. So what we actually did, on, based on this uh, performance, we then actually split groups in three different uh, subgroups. So we had a left bias group, a right bias group, and a no bias group. 
And they actually calculated these bias groups by actually using the 50% confidence uh, interval of one individually fitted um, psychometric function. So we basically had a sort of cutoff where we decided which people were showing a left bias, a right bias, or no bias. And then first of all, we just said, well, people who we identify as showing a left bias you know, on one day, do they also show a left bias on a second day and a third day? So we basically ran the experiment over three different days. They were mini uh, separated by a minimum of 24 hours. And hopefully, as you can see here, participants' baseline bias was hugely consistent sort of across the different days. So this is day, day one with day two, day two with day three, and then obviously day one with day three here. So they were hugely correlated. So people who show a bias on one occasion tend to show the same bias on repeated uh, occasions. So this kind of initially maybe supports the notion that there is a basic trait. You know, that it's not just random behavior. People do kind of show biases consistently over time. And we then looked at what happened to the time on task effect. And remember, if you look at the Corbetta and Schumann's model, you would expect over time, this is kind of the effect over time, the bias to shift to the right, you know, independent of initial bias. And that's really not what we found, because what we found is very much like, is like expected, the participants who had a left foot bias kind of shifted rightwards. But on the other hand, the participants who had a rightward bias actually shifted leftwards. So they really didn't show the expected um, rightward bias the participants who had no bias pretty much um, sort of stayed the same. And if you kind of look at this graph and think, okay, maybe this is kind of just, you know, regression to the mean and kind of learning, we also kind of looked at the curve width, and the curve width actually gives you an indicator of variability, how variable is people's performance, you know, over time. And very much like you would expect, so the curve width actually became greater, you know, throughout the course of the experiment, because obviously people were kind of tiring out and were sort of finding stuff uh, sort of more difficult. But the important thing is that <coughs> curve width, so this is the variability that people showed over time, and the shift in baseline was actually uncorrelated. So there was no correlation between the shifts that we demonstrated here and the increase in curve width, or generally sort of the change um, in the curve width of the psychometric function. And really, just to kind of look at this um, again, what we also did is we then also looked at the relationship between the initial bias and the shift um, over time. And what we found there, because you can say, okay, why are you making this kind of binary distinction? Why are you grouping people in left and right bias? Why don't you just you know, put, look at them all together? Which is kind of, kind of what we did here. So what we actually found here is that the stronger the initial bias, the stronger the shift in bias over time in the opposite direction. So what that basically means is that people with a, bigger, with a big left bias then shifted more to the right compared to people with a smaller bias. And the same was actually true for the right bias. So people who had a bigger initial right bias and shifted kind of more um, in the opposite direction. So there was actually a negative um, correlation on that. Okay, so um, what can we conclude from this data? Um, but I would actually like to argue that maybe it's possible that we actually have genuine uh, sort of behavior differences and, and genuine subtypes in the population in relation to spatial attention. You know, we all know a lot about individual differences. People haven't really looked at this very much in relation to spatial bias or sort of spatial attention. So maybe it's actually a sort of stable trait because what we've actually found is that the bias remained consistent over three different days. So maybe there are actually different subtypes and maybe they're actually di uh, driven by varying anatomical asymmetries like, like Tibor de Schotten and people actually found. And maybe they're also driven by functional asymmetries. Because uh, there was an even more recent paper by uh, Kai et al. who actually found that participants who actually di di displayed atypical right hemisphere language production, this was actually an FMI study where they looked at this, so people who showed right hemisphere language production also displayed atypical left hemisphere spatial attention dominance, and they actually used the landmark task kind of to assess this. So they clearly people aren't all the same, and this is quite interesting. So if you have a right hemisphere language production dominance, you also tend to have a left hemisphere spatial attention dominance. So maybe it is actually true that trait actually determines, first of all, you know, your behavior, and then also it actually determines some kind of other function, like for example, time on task, which is kind of what we uh, looked at here. So coming back, you know, to these kind of, again, sort of dual root models um, of attention. So the question really then uh, here was, you know, is it really true that there's a right hemisphere naturalized attention network which actually whose activity decreases over time and therefore induces a uniform rightward bias kind of in all uh, participants. And we would really argue from this data that maybe this interpretation doesn't really hold because we found that patient participants who had initial rightward bias actually shifted leftwards rather than further rightwards which is very much what you would predict um, from that model. So what we actually propose instead and we kind of at the moment kind of doing EEG studies to kind of look into this a little bit more is we actually proposing instead that there might be some sort of neural fatigue 
uh, which kind of accounts a little bit better for the time on task effect. So maybe in participants with an initial leftward bias, fatigue is actually greater in the right hemisphere, causing the rightward shift. But in participants with an initial rightward bias, fatigue may be greater in the left hemisphere, and thus causing a leftward shift. And we're kind of at the moment trying to look uh, into that um, with EEG. And what we've already found is that basically the size of the bias that you show is very much driven by the involvement <coughs> of the right, right hemisphere. So the greater involvement you have of the right hemisphere, the greater the pseudo neglect, the bias that you kind of show. But really, these specific um, issues we haven't really quite addressed um, yet. OK, so what can we conclude from this? There seem to be differences in attention and biases, um, and these differences could reveal genuinely observer subtypes. They may be driven both by anatomically and functional asymmetries, because there's been other studies kind of pointing um, in this direction. And maybe if you have these kind of observer differences, this actually leads to different behavioral patterns. So we've looked at time on task. There might be other behavioral patterns which are interesting. So it does actually challenge current models of attention and alertness, which seem to assume that we all have a unifying uh, lateralized attentional uh, network. OK, and this really just leaves me uh, to kind of um, thank my collaborators, in particular Keith Muir and Stephanie Rosett, sort of on the clinical side. So they were kind of involved in the clinical side. This is Keith, who's basically stopping me from talking about the rehab data. So don't, sit, don't mention it at all. Then really the more behavioral studies, Gregor Toot, uh, Gemma Liamoth, in particular um, Chris Benwell, who kind of really very much sort of drove uh, this last data set. And this is really just, as you can imagine, especially with a rehabilitation study, there are a lot of um, clinical people and other people kind of involved in kind of helping you getting the patients together and keeping them on track, you know, for performing the tasks. And then last but not least, the different um, funding bodies. And that's really it. Thank you very much. Forced to me to give a kind of vote of thanks to Michael and field questions. And I should premise the questions. They have to be benevolent questions, not critical questions. Partly because, as our external examiner, uh, Micah has the record for being the most benevolent person. She, she uh, stripped out a third of the written work for the examiners, and she also elevated student scores when examiners were being a bit harsh. So most people wouldn't know that. But uh, I mean, uh, Micah's Im immensely modest there. She prefaced the talk saying there's no progress in 20 years, but, but actually, in the heart of it, you see there's, there's effectively a cure in the offing for neglect, which improves quality of life, and that shouldn't be underestimated. So, okay, you've had time to think about questions and prepare them. Anybody wants to go? No critical questions allowed? Amanda. Really boring, um, probably irrelevant question, but I wondered if there's any relationship with handedness with your observer subtypes? Yes, and in fact, I mean, I think this is really an important point because the effects that we've demonstrated at the moment were very much for right-handed people. So we very much kind of really initially selected to people <coughs> to be right-handed because there is a whole kind of shift in bias with left-handed people. So I think this is another whole interesting question, basically, what happens in left-handed people? And I would think that initially, you know, and even, you know, Cobetta would probably wouldn't claim this right attentional network, I think it's, there, it's very much linked to kind of right-handedness because with left-handed people, we already know that they either have more bilateral rep representation or even representation, you know, possibly even in the left hemisphere. But I think it's a really interesting question because I think it's really related to that. So if we're really saying there are different subtypes, then clearly just how does handedness relate to that? Because sometimes it's not as straightforward in saying left-handedness then is kind of mediated then by the left attention network. It's more bilateral. So this is an, another, I think, interesting question. It's just, you know, whenever I kind of have student populations, I ask everybody who's kind of left-handed. And then you have an occasion a year where you get a, lo get a lot of left-handers and you can do studies. And then this year we just had absolutely no left-handers. So it's, it's definitely on, on the agenda to look into. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure whether I can ask a question. <laughs> 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 it's possible. I will try. Yeah. You said at the beginning that you're not a big fan of the comic coding uh, theory. Yes. Yes. I, I am a big fan. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I mean, if you define the comic coding uh, theory as that actions are stored together with the perceptual effects that these actions have in the environment, don't some of your data actually speak for the comic coding theory? You know, like your anti pointing task behavior. If the patients cannot create a representation of the effect of the action, then of course they would think that the action itself. Uh, no, I would completely agree with that. And I think there's another way of looking at that because I've kind of really squeezed it into kind of David's and Mel's kind of framework. But I think the problem 
the difference really there is, you know, in direct action, you have like egocentric coding and allocentric coding. Mm -hmm. And I would then more look at that. So as soon as you need allocentric coding, which you basically say, this is the object in relation to another one, in relation to, to kind of to the environment. And that, this is how I would say, and this is really what they have the problem. And you write, and you can then say, this is clearly, in this case, the perception driving the action. I would completely agree with that. And I would also really push it, and I've talked to Daniela a little bit about this. I would actually say that quite a lot of actions really you can't ignore the perceptual side because especially when, when actions are more complex, like for example in driving, you have a lot of heavy perceptual input that you need to act on. I think this is one of the tasks where that comes in. It's just, it, the, my, uh, it, it's just, I think if you purely kind of look at that model, then you would kind of miss some spare abilities. And I think this is really the point that David was trying to make at the time as well. Because if you really think perception and actions are the same, then the spare abilities that some patients have, like agnosic patients and neglect patients, I think you'd miss that. You know, because, because the, uh, the, the spread abilities that they have are kind of limited, but they are there. And I think just thinking about a dual root model allows you that to kind of identify them. So I'm, I'm thinking it's just more helpful in terms of the approach. I think that dual root model merges into the common coding area. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I think this is an interesting question because I do, because I think the temporal, but you see, everything merges into the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is just really clever. So yeah, up to, you know, true. <laughs> I had a question. Um, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, but uh, about your line bisection task and, and your idea of the fatigue, well, you're showing that so the people with the right bias move left and the people with the left bias move right. So isn't this, they're sort of they're getting better and getting rid of their bias? No, and in fact, I mean, this was very much one of the criticisms, you know, because all you're showing basically is that there's some vision to the mean that people are getting better. And the reason that we think that people aren't getting better is because the curve width increases. So I don't really quite see how people can improve on the task and at the same time become more variable. Because if you then look at curve width, which is basically the difference you know, between the beginning and the end point of the asymptote, is that curve widths become wider. So clearly, over time, they struggle more with the task rather than showing learning. Well, they're becoming more variable in their responses, but they're calibrating what they have to be doing. This is two different right, aspects of yeah, but I would expect them, but, but, the, but they were also uncorrelated. So I think if that's true, I would expect them to be correlated. I would then expect there to be a relationship between the, be, between the increase in curve widths and the reduction in bias. And it, it was uncorrelated. So I wouldn't necessarily expect that. If people, if they could be probing different uh, aspects of uh, the problem. Like it could be an increase in internal noise so that it could be causing a reduction in your... Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's, I mean, I kind of had exactly this kind of question in Aberdeen, and I kind of think, you know, it should be related, but, but this was exactly the argument that come back. So I think what we should then do, and what we haven't done, you should have like a vertical control condition. So if it had a vertical control, control condition, you would then expect again, you know, the regression to the mean, you would expect the increase in variation, but not the shift in bias. And that's what we really should have done, and we didn't, and we got it published. So I think we were lucky, <laughs> lucky to review some of you. <laughs> I was curious about the mechanism of the the changes after the, the raw yes. realization yes. Do you think it's some sort of compensation or something that we use all the time? So if you took a normal participant and gave them a rod that was rigged, that had lead shot yes. in one slide, yes. would you cause a long-term change in their uh, I think this is a little bit, I think, what people try to look at with prism adaptation, because I think people will kind of adapt to that, and then there's a certain carry over, kind of over time, and then you lose it. And I think it is an interesting question, because with neglect and prism adaptation, they adapt to that, and I would expect they would adapt to the different weighting as well. And they do then carry that over for weeks and months. So in prison adaptation, neglect patients really seem to be using that adaptation long term, whereas people like you and me don't. And nobody really knows why that's the case. But I think it's true. I think the mechanisms are actually very similar. And kind of, you know, you're kind of adapting you know, to, to the feedback that you're getting, and you then kind of transfer that into your behavior long term. And nobody knows why, but that's what neglect patients kind of really seem to be doing. So I think Stephanie is going to play around with that a little bit more and kind of looking at different ways and kind of then see how people adapt to that and whether they do. And I would suspect they do, because I think People don't really know how prison adaptation works, and they get exactly what this mediates, but I think parietal structures are implicated in that. So I think you can actually do this via parietal structures, which are maybe uh, unimpaired, and then kind of use it more long term. But it's, uh, my thinking, thinking on that isn't very clear, but that's kind of what I feel. Yeah, that's um, a good point. Um, I'm curious about, so you said the delayed pointing would be impaired in patients, yeah. especially in like, um, Do you have an idea how long does it take? Yes, I mean, the, we've done one experiment on that, and we basically had a delay 
it was quite long. So we had a condition exactly like the pool pointing task, and then they were basically, so the light would then come off, they had to wait for si five seconds, and they, they then had to reach. And they were then very impaired in the reaches for the left space, actually. So then they really couldn't, and again, I think my argument there is <coughs> that it has to produce a more long-term spatial mapping, so they clearly have to retain that mapping kind of more long-term to then perform the reach. So what we looked at was five seconds. I think Mel's argument would be, the delay kicks in after a few milliseconds. I'm not so quite so sure about that, actually, because I think you need a bit of a bigger delay before the task becomes difficult for something for, for neglect patients. So was that your question? Or? Yeah, so because we know that there are temporal differences <coughs> in the two groups, in the two streams, and I was wondering if exactly. the scale of that compares, yes. but I think what you're talking yes. about is much longer. So yes, exactly. exactly. Because there are different uh, interpretations in relation to how quick the timing is in the dorsal stream, and we just really kind of wanted to kind of move away from that debate and really saying we just want to make sure it's really very, very long it is really five seconds but but I think Otto's kind of shown data where he's basically saying there is no sudden shift you know from immediate to kind of uh, more long-term delay and I would actually agree with that I think you know the deterioration is probably going to be gradual a bit like what he found in for, op for optical tax here so yeah uh, I, th I don't think there is a, I don't believe in Matt's idea of it suddenly just disintegrating I don't think so. <coughs> so you would argue for like a memory, memory working memory, spatial working yes. memory. Yes, memory. yes exactly. You make this argument about um, you know, online being okay, and you show uh, clearly that in pro pointing, the patient goes accurately to the object, and, and it contrasts entirely with the beginning where you show a straight line and, and the patient marks one end of it when asked to mark the middle. And there's something that sort of doesn't quite gel for me, and it may be just, um, I mean, if you've got one line and you can pick it up in the middle, then somehow you appreciate the two ends. Um, my real question comes in, how do you account for extinction? Because you know, you've got, if you've got two objects, then I guess the patient with neglect will ignore the contral lesional yeah, side. Um, but you know, had they been asked to point to the middle of the two objects, then that's under direct control and you're doing it here and now. And in, in effect, or maybe they don't show any impairment if they're reaching for the middle of two objects. Um, no, I, th I think that's quite a different task because because if you're reaching, I think these experiments are, are done. So if you basically have two objects and you ask people to reach for the middle, they really struggle with that because they can they can't maintain sort of two objects at the same time. You've got a single object, it's got two ends. You know, when does but uh, yeah. the reason, it, I think they can't do it because it's a bit like line by section because you have a huge perceptual input. So if you have the rod initially, like a long rod, you ask them to pick it up, they don't pick it up correctly. So the reason that they can actually do it is because they're then getting the proprioceptive feedback that it's tilted. I mean, Ian Robinson already showed initially that there's a big difference between kind of pointing to a rod and grasping it. So people are already a little bit better at grasping, but they're not perfect. And I think one of the reasons that this training works, you know, apart from doing the action, is because in the parietal cortex you have proprioceptive as well, and people are actually using the proprioceptive feedback to kind of improve on that task. And then in the long term, that kind of filters down to the perception. But it almost points out because it's not, you're right, because, because you have a long word, so perceptually they can't do it. So, so without, which is why, you know, if you just ask them to point to the end, you know, they don't benefit so from it. So if the object gets smaller and smaller, then presumably the grasp it should go for the midpoint. It yes. should make proportionately less errors. It's only when it's a very long yes. we have to look That's true. It. And I think this is also important really about the pointing task that I found because they're basically pointing kind of to a single target. So I think if you had a target with lots of distractors, people well, would just be desperate. The environment you show That's, um, there's, there's things in, in, in the back of the lab and you've still got a segment. Yeah, no, no but, but I think the, the problem with neglect is actually, no, no, but, no, but they were actually sitting in front of it completely. And they were, in fact, I should have said that they were kind of pretty much sitting in darkness. So we're sitting in total darkness okay. and then the lights would come yeah, no, so there, there was the clear. Because I think this is an important point because as soon as you turn it into a search task, they're awful. Yeah. You know, they can't, they couldn't do it. Any other questions before we move next door? So I, I think we should thank uh, Michael and Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Wow, this is actually, best. for some reason I already have one, actually. Maybe as external examiner you gave one to me, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I must be the only person in our stream.